Good morning. I'm Pastor Mike from Park Avenue Baptist Church, and I'm so glad you've chosen to join us today. We at Park Ave want to be a help to you, so if you have a prayer request or a question about today's sermon, fill out the Connect card in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for being with us, and we hope you enjoy today's service. Good morning, Park Avenue Baptist Church. Thanks for being with us. We are in week three of our current sermon series, Where to Draw the Line, Why You Need Boundaries in Your Life, and How to Keep Them. And as we get started this week, uh, it's probably going to become readily apparent what area we're going to be talking about because I wanted to start out with a question for you. I would like you to think about it a little bit, maybe jot down a couple of answers uh, because I think this can be a valuable thing for us to evaluate. And that would be this. Uh, what five traits are most important to you in a friend? So go ahead, uh, give that some thought, jot a couple of uh, first responses down uh, while I do some review from our first two weeks. Uh, we started out talking about the idea of boundaries. Uh, we're uh, pulling on uh, a classic Christian book about to turn 30 years old from Cloud and Townsend called Boundaries, and the idea that God has given you personhood. Uh, and in that, you have some boundaries, some things that define you. And when we are in relationships of a variety of kinds, it's like having neighboring property. Uh, and we have to have a good sense of what defines me and what separates me from you and how are we going to navigate that together. And sometimes we have to be proactive in placing some boundaries in place uh, because the other person may not be honoring those boundaries. Um, if you have a property line and you find out that your neighbor is constantly crossing that, you may decide it's time for a fence. And the same is true for us relationally in these things. Also really good for us to remember while we talk about my property and your property is that it's all God's property. We talked about these concepts that boundaries are good and necessary things. We shouldn't view them negatively although they can be implemented in a negative way. Uh, God believes in boundaries and utilizes them for our protection. People resist boundaries and resent their limitations. And then lastly, functioning within good boundaries actually gives us more freedom, not less. And a lot of times we have a bad, a negative impression of boundaries because we're like, oh, it's limitations. But those limitations can actually free us. Uh, boundaries help us take care of ourselves, but that's not all. They also create safe space where we can care for others, just like Jesus did. So boundaries do help us to guard ourselves, but in keeping ourselves healthier, we're actually able to have better, richer, fuller relationships with other people. Uh, last week, we talked about the area of work. And we said together that work is a meaningful endeavor. It was not a result of sin. It predated sin's arrival on the scene. It helps to provide us with dignity, productivity, and purpose. And what you do may not feel important, but it is extremely important how you do what you do. And a big overarching principle throughout this entire series is that you cannot change any other person. You only have the power to change yourself. So you don't have the power to make somebody else honor your boundary, but you do have the power to create a stronger boundary, to communicate that more clearly, uh, perhaps more emphatically. Um, the only person you can change is you, and honestly, we're often not very good at that. Uh, so, there's some review for us. I want to circle back around to uh, the five traits that are most important to you in a friend. Um, I would encourage you, if you're watching with someone else, to, to share uh, with one another some of the things that came to mind. Um, a lot of research, a lot of survey work has been done in this area, and there are some common things that uh, consistently surface. 
Uh, here are 10 of them. Uh, what traits are most important to you in a friend? Uh, people will say, well, they need to be accepting. Uh, they need to be accepting of me. We need to have commonalities, common interests. We need to enjoy the same types of things, uh, at least to some degree, think the same way on key topics. Uh, they need to be dependable. Uh, they need to be fun. Uh, I want a friend that I enjoy spending time with. Uh, they, they need to know me. Uh, they need to understand how I function. They need to be a good listener. They need to be loyal. Uh, there needs to be uh, reciprocity. In other words, it's not a one-sided relationship. There is give and take. It's not one-sided. Uh, they need to be supportive and they need to be trustworthy. And probably most of us would agree that, oh yeah, those are some good things. I didn't even think of some of those. Yeah, that's a really good list. Uh, but what is a friendship actually? And really, a friendship is a relationship that is chosen based on affinity more than on function. In other words, uh, you, you have relationships with neighbors because of proximity. You have relationships with family. You didn't get to choose them. You kind of got stuck with them. And you got to figure out how to navigate that. But our friendships, uh, and you get coworkers, and that's because well, we work at the same place, we do the same job, so we're uh, we're acquaintances. We're, we would even say, well, we're friends. I'm friends with some of them. But true friendship is based entirely on affinity, on liking the other person, on wanting to spend time with them, of finding their company beneficial to you and feeling like your company may be beneficial to them. Uh, as a result, I think oftentimes we view our friendships as extremely fragile because they don't have all these other supports of, but well, we have to like each other, we're family. Uh, but actually friendships are in a really unique zone because they are built on affinity. Uh, and so we, invest in those relationships in a different way than we do in some other situations. And our attachments can be more magnetic than even our commitments. Um, you can feel stuck with someone because of a commitment, uh, but, but a friendship, you're gonna keep working to cultivate that affinity, to keep deepening that friendship. And that's an important thing for us to remember. Now, a couple of things that you may have said, you've probably certainly heard said, um, but I thought you were my friend. Uh, and sometimes it's because we wanted a friendship, we didn't evaluate if this person had some of those key traits, and then they turned on us and were shocked. I thought you were my friend, but we didn't evaluate the stability, the reliability, of this affinity and sometimes we get swept into something that we later find out is unhealthy and then maybe you've heard somebody say I've been hurt so much so I'm done with friendships uh, and that's a sad place it's an understandable place for people to be uh, but there's there's a wisdom that says that your deepest wounds have come in the context of relationships and your deepest healing will come in the context of relationships. In other words, yes, you may have been hurt very badly in relationship, in friendships. Uh, but that is not an indictment on all friendships. That's an indictment on unhealthy friendships. And so we don't throw all of it away. We say, I need to be more careful. I need to be more discerning. I need to set better boundaries. So today we're going to be looking at a couple of major ideas. Uh, we were created by God for relationships. Uh, vertically with him and horizontally with other people. Uh, it's what we were designed for. And to say, well, I'm not going to have relationships with people. They always let me down. It's just me and God. Well, then you're not living life the way God intended. He intended for it to be both. And God designed healthy boundaries so we could have healthy friendships. Um, 
I want to take some time, look just a little bit at some examples that we see from the life of Christ uh, of how different relationships function for him. Uh, we can start right out and say that Jesus dealt with different people in different ways. Um, he didn't approach everyone the same way. And we could almost think of that like we would a, a target, um, that there were people that were at the center of his relational core that he would call friends. They were the core disciples, the twelve. Um, even within the twelve, there was three that he gave some individualized attention to. Uh, stepping out from those friends were a group of followers uh, that was a larger group. And stepping out from that, there were a group of fans, people who wanted to see what all the fuss was about, wanted to see if he did another miracle, another healing, another feeding. We want to be close enough to see the spectacle, but who not, weren't necessarily on board with anything that he was teaching. And so those three levels of relationship, they look different, they function differently, uh, and, and they get different amounts of attention. Uh, so, to look at a few biblical examples, in Luke 12, starts right out, Meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands were milling about and stepping on each other. Uh, so, it was so crowded that physical harm was happening as a result. Um, this was a situation of fans. Uh, Jesus didn't have close relationships with all of these people. In Luke 14, uh, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciples, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Uh, a statement like that tends to really separate the fans from the followers. Uh, he continued, Otherwise you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So he was, in some ways, creating some boundaries of what defines who really belongs with me and who's just along for the show. In Luke 15, we see these events that tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Now, in our Western culture, we'll pretty much eat with anyone. Uh, but in Eastern culture, to share a meal together was to share life. It was a, uh, it was a much closer, much more meaningful thing that we don't necessarily understand. So. When Jesus ate with these notorious sinners, uh, that was very troubling to the, to the Pharisees. Uh, in John chapter 6, uh, Jesus has just talked about uh, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which will get some attention. Uh, verse 60, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And a few verses later in verse 66, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Uh, so people who were in the follower circle at this point said, mm, I'm not even a fan. Like, this is too extreme. This is too radical. Uh, not understanding what he was actually saying, but they made some decisions there. So again, Jesus dealt with different people in different ways. Fans got confrontation. Followers got choices. What do you want to do? Do you want to take this further? Do you want to walk away? And friends got commitments. Uh, they got commitments from him, but they also got challenged to make very, very serious commitments to him. And so again, we were created by God for relationships. And boundaries are a helpful thing. Healthy boundaries result in healthy relationships. Well, to take that same uh, bullseye target mentality 
and transfer it for us, we have different relationships, different friendships that function at different levels. Uh, they don't always stay the same. Sometimes we're really close to someone during a certain season of life and things kind of drift uh, and someone else moves further into the inner circle. Uh, but we have casual relationships. Uh, people that we know, but we don't know them well. We don't share a lot with them. We have close relationships, people that we see more and share more with. And then we have the inner core of committed relationships. These are people that you can be vulnerable with, that you can share. Uh, these are the people that uh, when your car breaks down at 3 a.m., these are the people that you can call and say, help. You don't tend to do that with casual acquaintances. Uh, they're not terribly receptive to that. So, because we have limited resources of attention, emotion, energy, and time, we will have friendships of different types, and that's okay. I think it's curious that friendship is one of those areas where we give very little instruction and just kind of go, oh, you'll figure it out. I mean, parents are often protective of their children and of what kind of friends they have, what kind of influences. We're going to get back to that in a little bit. Uh, but Jesus gives us a lot of help. The Bible gives us a lot of help in understanding some of these areas. So, a few other things. First, how you see the friendship may not be how they see the friendship. So you may look at the friendship and go, oh, this is a committed friendship. And they may look at the friendship and go, oh yeah, we're friends. And they think it's casual, and you think it's committed, and as a result, often you get disappointed that they're not as responsive as you think they should be because you're functioning at two different levels. Um, lack of communication can lead to escalating frustration. Uh, this is very true. If we don't communicate what our expectations are in a friendship, uh, we can end up frustrated because we think, well, of course they should do this. They should know that I need this. And unless those things are communicated, uh, there's gonna be a rise in tension. And you can't make someone else change their expectations, but you can communicate your limitations. Um, there's nothing quite like having someone declare to the world, this is my best friend, and you don't know that you didn't know that you were agreeing to be best friends. Um, and so many of us have experienced some of that awkwardness from one side or the other. Um, Growing up, I enjoyed Legos. Now, back in my day, yes, Legos had been invented then. Uh, back in my day, it was a bucket or bin of Legos. It was a variety of different colors, different uh, varies, variations on the shapes, and uh, you just used your imagination and you built, and I loved that. Legos today function a little differently, uh, that they are, they are sets with a specific design and a specific way you're supposed to put it together, really much more like a model. Well, that's far too restrictive for me and too taxing. So I like Legos my way, but Legos can really help us to understand friendships uh, because Lego blocks have a limited number of points of connection. Uh, a standard block has... Uh, eight prongs on it where you can attach another brick, but you, you really need to be utilizing at least two prongs in order to have some stability. And um, so you only have so many things you can attach to a single brick. Well, the same is true for people. They have a limited number of points of connection. Uh, that can be different based on personality, based on stage of life, based on other commitments. Uh, but the reality is, while we don't always all have the same number of points of connection, we all have a limited number of them. And so we need to steward those 
And, and sometimes we feel like, well, I should be closer with all these different people. And it's requiring too many points of connection, more points of connection than you actually have to offer. And so you have to accept some of your limitations. Um, because each friendship has unique aspects, we can tend to have boundaries that are too open, too closed, or occasionally just right. Uh, it's hard to get boundaries correct. Some of the challenge of that is that friendships continue to change as we as people change. And so a boundary that was effective before suddenly is ineffective now, even though we're still the same people, our circumstances have changed and that affects what makes for an effective boundary. So we need to be patient with ourselves and patient with each other while we make the necessary adjustments. Uh, that's just part of the reality that we deal with. But we are people of extremes and we don't tend to find balance well. So relationally, we will often either build walls that are way too high or we don't have any walls at all. And neither one of those is a safe or healthy place to be. So I want to consider some principles that can help us to get our boundaries right. Uh, first, I want to start with a, a really core scripture with some really needed wisdom for us in this area from the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise, associate with fools and get in trouble. Uh, very basic principle here is who you spend time with, they will have influence on you. Uh, that's just the reality. Uh, you hang around with people who are making good decisions. Those good decisions will start to rub off on you, and also you will get some of the spillover effect of the good decisions they are making. By the same token, you decide to hang around with foolish, short-sighted, self-destructive people, and not only will you probably become more reckless, but you're going to get hit by the shrapnel of their destructive decisions. It's just the way things are. So, in light of all of this, uh, we can tend to have a problem with too few boundaries or too many, no walls at all, or walls that are too high. Let's look real quickly at those problems. Uh, the problem of having no walls at all, of not having good boundaries. And that leaves us open to the influence and the effect of a lot of people that we would be better off Without, we need to create some distance with them. Uh, Proverbs speaks to a number of these types of people. I just want to give a couple of examples. Uh, you could do a really interesting study through the book of Proverbs and um, just kind of take some notes as you read of what is said of positively about what good friendships look like and over here, what does it tell me about negative friendships and what those look like. And you can glean a lot of wisdom that way. Uh, Proverbs 16, verse 28 says, A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. Um, troublemakers and gossips are exciting people to be around. Uh, there's always drama. Uh, that can seem really appealing in the short term, uh, but again, I would remind you, you're going to get hit by the shrapnel of what they're doing. And um, sometimes gossip can make us feel very powerful, like they're, they're feeding us information that I wouldn't know otherwise, and we can, oh, really? But can I just guarantee you of something? That if the gossip is talking to you about other people, you can almost guarantee they are talking to other people about you. Uh, in Proverbs 27, verse 6, we see this. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Now, normally we would think a choice between kisses and wounds, uh, give me kisses. But wounds from a sincere friend are things that they tell you that might hurt you but that you really needed to hear. And it wasn't their intention to be mean or cruel or damaging. It was their desire to be helpful. 
So it's a productive wound. But kisses from an enemy are, they're distractions while they stab you in the back. Um, their intention is for harm and you let them close enough to do harm because you think they are on your side and they are watching out for you when in reality the exact opposite is true. So there are needs for us to be cautious in these areas. Uh, the second problem that we looked at is uh, walls that let no one in when we've been hurt, when we want to protect ourselves. And we miss some things that God designed for us when we do that. In Proverbs 17, verse 17, we see that a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in times of need. Now, is a friend always 100% loyal? Probably not because they're human. They're fallible. Um, are they always there for you in a time of need? No, because they have limitations. But you're going to know that there's a heart intent of they didn't mean to hurt me. They didn't mean to let me down. And you know what? I let them down. I disappoint them sometimes. But because we're friends, we work through it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, uh, we see some of the benefits of relationship. It says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Uh, notice there's a mutualness there. Uh, there's a reciprocity of not just two are better than one, he can help me succeed. No, we help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Uh, so you did not know that the uh, the media alert phenomena was biblical, but that idea of help, I've fallen and I can't get up, that's right here in this passage. Uh, verse 11, likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better. For a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So, again, going back to our target, you can have people with whom you are involved. If you allow uh, things to move in, they are going to have greater influence on you. You're going to have greater influence on them. And then the innermost is intimate relationships. Uh, people with whom you can be truly vulnerable that you can tell about your struggles, your heartaches, your doubts, and they're gonna walk through that with you. Uh, those people are not easy to find, but they are definitely worth searching for. Uh, I wanna take some time to do some application, uh, one very specific in this area of friendship and one uh, that is really more gospel-centered. So first matter of application, uh, what traits are most important to you in a friend? You may have your own list. You may have this one that we provided for you. But my question would be, are you allowing God to transform you into this kind of friend? Um, these things don't come naturally to us. They take work. They take commitment. They take humility for us to go, wow, I'm not good at that. But my, my friend deserves better than what I'm giving them presently. I want God to do a transforming work in my relationships so that I can be the kind of friend I need to be. Uh, often we have a very high standard of what we're looking for in a friend, but we think, well, people should just accept me as I am. This is who I am. And we don't work to change ourselves to be the people God truly desires us to be. And secondly, in terms of our application, uh, I want to look at a short passage together that really helps us to zero this whole area in uh, on the gospel. In John 15, uh, beginning of verse 12, we see this. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Now, Jesus is teaching here. 
This is pre crucifixion, resurrection, but even so, the way in which he has loved his followers is pretty radical. It's pretty extreme. It's a high bar for us to try to live up to, and it got even higher later on. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, something Jesus was about to do. You are my friends if you do what I command. So Jesus has set a boundary for those who should truly identify him as, oh, I'm friends with Jesus. I have a relationship with Jesus. How do you know if you have a relationship with Jesus? Are you obeying what he says? Well, not really, but I go to church. Well, I used to, and I try to be a good person. Then can I just tell you, then you have a great relationship with trying to be good, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus if you're not seeking to obey him. Uh, we continue. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I want to drill down into that for a moment when we think about what we look for in a friend. That we did not choose Jesus, Jesus chose us. Jesus and I had nothing in common. I was not accepting, dependable, loyal, supportive, or trustworthy. I didn't know him and I didn't want to know him. I was a bitter rebel. I had nothing to offer that he needed from me. And yet, somehow, he wanted me. He chose me. I would make a horrible friend, and he made me family. Our God is amazing in his grace. That reframes that a little bit for us, I, I, I certainly hope. So he said there again, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Now we perk up when we get to that part. We're like, oh, Jesus, you have my attention now. And I think often what we hear goes something like this. Is Jesus saying that his name is like a blank check I can use to get God to give me anything and everything I want? Because that sounds pretty appealing. It sounds good to me. I'm sure I could get other people on board with a relationship with Jesus if this is true. And I would have to say, not exactly. Why is that not the case? Well, first of all, we are selfish and we are deceived. And we ask for stupid, short-sighted things. And God loves us way too much to say yes to that. So this is not a blank check. So what is it? Well, if we look at that passage again, and we're going to, when we are obedient to our calling, the calling God has given us, that is to go and produce lasting spiritual fruit. When we're obedient to that, Jesus will resource us lavishly to find success in those efforts. In other words, if we are producing spiritual fruit, he wants to resource us to produce more spiritual fruit, to reach more people, to impact more lives. And those are the things that he will give whatever we ask for. But when we ask only to enhance our own comfort, the faucet gets turned off. Uh, when we are being selfish, when we are just pursuing what we want, Jesus does not have an interest in bankrolling that endeavor. So, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for 
using my name. This is my command. Love each other. So what does it mean to love others the way Jesus loved us? Well, there's a couple things I can come to mind for me. One, he loved us when we didn't deserve it. Do we only love those who we feel like are deserving of our love? His love was selfless and sacrificial. He did not befriend people who could make his life easier. He befriended fishermen and tax collectors and political zealots. And his love saw our ultimate good, not our immediate comfort. So, I cannot love like Jesus if I won't let Jesus do a work in me. So, I will only be as good a friend to the people in my world as I allow Jesus to be the friend that I need and to do a transforming work in me. I'd like to close this in a word of prayer before I do. just want to repeat for us those big ideas. We were created by God for relationships. And God designed healthy boundaries so that we could have healthy friendships. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. God, I thank you for the power of friendships. And for many of us, if we stop to think about it, we've seen the incredible influence good friendships can have. Unfortunately, many of us bear the wounds of bad friendships, bad relationships, and a lot of harm has been done there. God, would you help to redeem that? Would you help to bring healing to those hurting places so that we could move forward in relationships that honor you? Um, God, we need you in the midst of this. We cannot do it on our own. We're not resourced for that. We need what only you can offer. We thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us today. Have a great week, and continue to think on these things.